people say, well, when you see somebody who's, you know, died, are they always younger? And I always assumed that. I always thought that's what I was seeing. But I'm like, no, it's not that. It's that when you get on the other side, all of the things that are BS that you thought about yourself and that other people put on you and thought about you, those all fall away. It just kept kind of tugging at me that I needed to message him and I really don't like to do that and and it wouldn't quit. So I'm like, okay, fine, you know? And so I message him and I'm like, hey, this is going to sound super weird. And if you feel uncomfortable, just let me know and, and we'll end it here. And But I said, did you lose your daughter? And he had, and I'm like, oh, I just, I can feel her. And I told him, I said, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't drugs. It wasn't violence. This was just sudden, you know, just mysterious. And she really wanted him to know that it had something to do with her heart and that her sister would get checked. And I kept thinking the sister was a twin. And so like when that happens, it doesn't happen a lot and I can't conjure it up. It just either happens or it doesn't. I'm like, just say yes, no, don't feed into anything because I don't want to feel like I'm reading the situation. So we get to the end and apparently the girls used to tell people they were twins. They were close enough in size. And, and her message to him was, I can fly like Peter Pan now, daddy. And so he had this little Peter Pan figurine that he kept on his dresser and it had gotten knocked off that morning and they don't have cats or anything like that. And then, you know, I sent him this weird message. And so we became friends. And every time I would get out of the hospital after having respiratory failure, Brian would touch base with me and say, hey, you know, you should come to Cincinnati and talk to our near-death experience group. And I would make up some lie or whatever because I'm like, no, absolutely not. I'm not going to talk in front of a bunch of people. And so finally... The last time I had the anaphylaxis, and I want to get ahead of myself, but God had told me, he's, I'm like, just take me or heal me. I can't do this anymore. And he said, it's not me, it's you. And I'm like, what do you mean? It's your God. Just, you know, do what you do. And he said, you said you were going to go back and you said you were going to live and you're still hiding. If you're going to go back and you want to live, then live. Say yes. I keep putting opportunities in front of you and people in front of you and you just, you don't do it. So, so if you want to live, you go back and you say yes. And so Brian was the first person that got hold of me after I got out of the hospital. And he asked me again to come up and talk to his group. And I said, yes. And he was kind of flabbergasted. And I'm like, just don't talk to me anymore because I'll think of some reason that I can't. <laughs> That's amazing. That conversation that you're saying you were having with God, was that, that was after the experience? So I had between, I think, 2014. So two and a half, there was a two and a half year time period. And I had 18 episodes of anaphylaxis. We didn't know what was causing it. And it wasn't like your typical anaphylaxis. You give the person an EpiPen, maybe some steroids, and they do okay. The EpiPens, I, had, I always had two. And eventually I had like an injection of Benadryl because oral Benadryl wasn't fast enough. And then I had steroids. And I would take all of that as soon as it started. We would get in the car and we'd have just enough time to get to the emergency room and get intubated before I quit breathing. And they're like, it's just this rare kind of idiopathic anaphylaxis. We don't know what's causing it. And, and it's so funny. I always, I always tell people, especially women, I'm like, don't ever get anything mysterious if you're a woman, because if the doctor doesn't know what's wrong with you, but he does know you have a vagina, then you're probably crazy. <laughs> if you're a man, he'll, he'll find it. He'll figure out what it is. But if you're a woman, he's like, you've got a vagina, don't you? <laughs> I know exactly what's wrong with you. You're insane. And apparently they intubate people in the ER for that now. I'm like, why would you intubate me for anxiety? Like, are your ER doctors morons? It's like the University of Kentucky Hospital. Surely not. Why don't you call them and let them know there's nothing wrong with me and just to stop intubating me when I come in? And I'm like, what a moron. And it was so funny because it was the same doctor. Oh, gosh, I hated that guy. He came in and they had woke me up because we were going to start weaning off the vent. And he comes in and tells me, unless I'll sign a release to have a trach, he's not going to take me off the vent. And I, I've got paper and pen, and I'm like, I am an RN. And I show it to him, and I'm like, that's illegal. Wow. You cannot force me to agree to a procedure before you take me off a ventilator. If I want to come off the ventilator and die right now, I'm allowed to, you know. Why would he do that? Because he was an asshole. I mean, that's the only thing I've got. He just was so arrogant. He's like, this is really traumatic. You know, every time you come in, you have to be intubated. And to be intubated, you have to have a coma induced and have a paralytic. And, you know, if you just had a trach, we could just hook up to your trach. And I'm like, but if nothing's wrong with me and it's just that I have a vagina and I'm crazy, I'm so over doctors at this point. And they went ahead and extubated me. I passed the weaning trials. 
And within four hours, he had to reintubate me because it had happened again. And I'm like, there you go. Big surprise. Does that look like crazy to you? I don't think so. And I'd be broke out in hives, head to toe. I mean, things you can't possibly, you know, fake. And all my labs would be screwed up. And, and I'm like, you know, it's okay just to say you don't know. I would have respected you more for that. But we did. We finally figured out it was a mast cell activation disorder. And they said I had had a spinal surgery because I'd gotten beat up by a patient. I can't remember if they used one or both, but I know they used bone glue and they might have used some cadaver bone. Did you say beat up by a patient? Yeah, yeah. We had an eye doctor in. Physically beat up by a patient? Oh, yeah. It happens to nurses all the time. Oh, jeez. Okay. Um, Sorry. That's... And nothing is ever done about it, no matter how lucid the patient is. So he had knocked down our director of nursing the first day, and she didn't think to mention that in any of our daily safety meetings, which is important to know because if I know that, I don't ever put myself in between the patient and the door and um, or let him get in between the door and me. So we had him kind of in this recliner chair and we were going to put a deep line in and I had explained to him the surgeon was coming up or the interventional radiology guy. His nurse got him in the chair, got him all comfortable. I mean, he was fine. And, and so I got between the bed and the chair and we had this bed that goes all the way to the floor because he kept getting up and falling. And so you put the bed down super low and then you just come in and they're sitting in the floor. And we got everything all dressed to do the, the line in his neck. And I'm explaining to him, you know, you're going to feel a little prick and then some burning and that's going to numb up your neck. And so I'm just walking him through it. And the doctor gets everything set and he just bolts up in the chair and he says, I don't consent to this. And he punches me in the face while I fall down between the bed and the chair and I can't get up because the bed is so low. I don't have any way to pull up. And he's come over the side of the chair and he's just punching me in the side of the head. Jesus. Right. And the doctor can't figure out how to unlock the chair to move the chair and he slings and he throws the doctor's stuff everywhere, hits the doctor, finally a tech across the hall, hears the commotion. She comes across, undoes the chair, helps me get out. But I had broken my wrist, torn my rotator cuff, and then completely blew out the discs between C4 and C5 and C5 and C6. And so ended up having, I mean, I didn't miss any work, stayed that whole day, still took care of that patient. That was in August. I had surgery in November, which work didn't pay for. They're like, oh, that's pre-existing. What? My doctor's like, there's no way that's <laughs> so obviously like she was okay till this. And uh, he got in there to do the surgery and he told Don, he's like, you know, we'll be in and out 45 minutes. And they come in through the front and they, like two and a half hours, he put a call out to the waiting room and he's like, she's okay. There's just disc everywhere. It looks like somebody just blew it up. And so he was picking all the pieces of disc out of the spinal column there and screwed my bones together and... Um, and they either used cadaver bone or cadaver glue at some point. And we think maybe that's what triggered the whole autoimmune anaphylaxis. And it was months later. I had surgery just before Thanksgiving. And then my first anaphylaxis was in August. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was just cr I mean, if you can, it was 18 times in two and a half years. I mean, I was in the hospital more than I was home. Yeah, I mean, we haven't even got to like the beef of the story. You've already went through the ringer. I mean, it's it's interesting that you it say that crazy. that happens all the time. I mean, we don't have to get into that. That's a whole other conversation. But that happens a lot with nurses. The patients is going off on them like that. Oh, yeah. Usually it's somebody who's confused. It's, right. you know, some little person with dementia who's scared or, and, you know, I can usually see it coming, especially in somebody who's not right. You can kind of see their their affect sort of change and you can see they're getting frustrated. And And if you're pretty intuitive, you can kind of, you know, put it off. Like I can say to somebody, if they're not wanting to take a bath or whatever, they're not wanting to have an IV put in, I can say, you know what, I bet it's really tough being in here because you don't really get to make any decisions and everything we do to you hurts, doesn't it? Uh, smart. You know, and I could just take that time and, and, and it really it drove home all the times I was in the hospital that everything they did to me hurt and nobody ever touched me in like this soothing way. Right. And <laughs> so it was a good lesson for me. And but I mean, I always did that. And I, you know, I would say, you know, let's just take a couple minutes, you know, are you having a hard day? Are you hurting anywhere? Because there's some things you can just resolve. And you, I could usually, you know, stop it. But this guy was just, it, it was crazy. And it was funny because his son came in and his son was super sweet. And he's like, he used to just beat the hell out of my mom and, and me. And, and the dad looks at me and he says, uh, am I going to have to pay for your injuries? And I'm like, okay, so I know you know what you did. and. And then he ended up dying like a couple months later, so we couldn't even go after oh, him Christ. for... Well, that's the cherry on top. Yeah, right? I'm like, damn you. <laughs> so so this, I didn't know that. So this is the experience that kind of led to the problems that you would have down the road 
which then one of those 18 you said in two years, one of your, your 18 episodes, which one, I mean, not that the number matters, but at what point did you have this near-death experience that, you know? It kind of does. So it was the first one and then the last one. So there were two? So I had two. Right. But the second one was just super quick. It was like a brief, you know, memo style conference with God. Hey, it's your fault. Get down there, live. When somebody asks you or gives you an opportunity to do something, say yes, or otherwise, why are you there? I was like, There's, you've been here already, so we're just going to give you the quick version. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and for somebody who's got social anxiety, I'm like, well, you don't ask much, do you? You want me to go out and tell my story? And like, could you pick anything else? I'm super smart. I'm good at research. There's lots of ways I can contribute. And I would give him names. I'm like, you know, Rose Paulison. She's wonderful. She loves to talk to people, loves to tell stories, really enjoys that sort of thing. She doesn't feel like she's going to throw up if she has to leave her house and go talk to somebody. That's your girl. And he's <laughs> like, no, no, it, it's you. <laughs> Not me. So if you don't mind getting into it, what happened the first time? Okay, so the first time, you know, I'd had the surgery. I was still home. I, had, I wasn't able to return to work yet because my employer was saying I had to come back without any restrictions. And there was no way that was ever going to happen because I have permanent neurological injuries. So I was still home. We were still kind of fighting work comp and everything. And it was, I think, just after my birthday in August. And uh, I'm just standing in the... Don and I weren't married yet. We were just dating. And, and uh, I was standing in the kitchen with my daughter and we're drinking strawberry smoothies. And I just started feeling weird. And I'm like, okay, something's not right. Like kind of, um, uh, we call it this impending sense of doom, like something bad was going to happen. And I'm like, okay, you're anxious. And I'm not typically an anxious person. I'm pretty even and I'm not prone to big shifts. I'm just pretty even. And so that was weird for me. And I was thinking, okay, you know, all right, you've got some just spotty anxiety. It happens to people, you know, take some deep breaths and then I noticed I was starting to have a little bit of a hard time swallowing. And I'm like, oh, I'm drooling. What the, what is wrong with me? And then I started having trouble breathing. So I have, I have a shellfish allergy, or I did for years, and avoiding it for so long, apparently it's not an issue now, but I always had EpiPens just in case. And because you can get these little sneaky exposures, but never in all my years had to use them. And I, I was like, I'm going to have to use that EpiPen. You know, and you don't, you never delay. You don't start with Benadryl. You always start with epinephrine. And so I gave the first shot and I started feeling better. And I'm like, son of a gun. I'm in, what am I reacting to? You know, I was hoping it wouldn't work because then it would be some, something else that was much easier to figure out. And um, my youngest son came home and he had just started driving. And I said, we need to go to the hospital. And he's like, you're all red. I said, yeah, I know. I'm itching like crazy. So we get to the hospital and he dropped me off and went to, park the car and I go in, that's a small hospital that was in the town that we lived in that was also owned by a bigger hospital system in Lexington. And I had worked at the bigger hospital system. And when the little hospital decided that they were going to expand their ICU, I was like, oh, I'll go there and work because that's like right near my house. That's perfect. So I happened to know the nurse that was triaging and she was just horrible. And I'm like, oh man, on my worst day, I, would, <laughs> I wouldn't want anybody to be taken care of by her. Oh, and, you know, we all know who they are. <laughs> Some nurses get offended when I say that. They're like, oh, you're one of those know-it-all nurses. I'm like, oh, come on. You know some nurse who's horrible that you would not want taking care of your family. <laughs> but it was her. And she's like, so what's wrong with you? And I'm looking up in the air. I'm having a hard time breathing. I've got a washcloth because I can't swallow my own spit. My voice is super hoarse, like at a whisper. I said, I'm having an anaphylactic reaction. And I set that first EpiPen on the counter. And I said, I took that. And I think I told her the time. And um, she's like, well, then why are you here? I'm like, what? Why am I? Do you know how it? What? This is like one of the basic ER emergencies, you know? <laughs> and um, I said, because I'm having trouble breathing. And you always go to the hospital after you take your EpiPen. And she's like, well, I don't have any rooms. I have one and it's clean, but I don't have a bed in it. And I'm like, I don't need a bed. I just need to be seen. And so she takes me in this wheelchair and she wheels me down this hallway that goes back to the restroom and there's a little room back there that the doctor can nap in. And it's just this hall and you're all the way down by yourself. So she just wheels me into this hall alone. I mean, that's like a tribute to how terrible of a nurse she is. You, This is the person you want to keep an eye on. She just leaves you there? She just left me there. She's like, when we get a bed in the room, I'll come get you. It shouldn't be too long. Okay. And so I'm sitting there and sitting there and I'm having harder, you know, more and more trouble breathing. And I'm getting strider, which is this whistling sound that your air makes when your throat closes enough. 
And so I pull out my EpiPen and because they come in two packs, thank goodness. And I give myself the second shot and I'm okay. I feel a little bit better for about 15 minutes, less like I'm going to die. And then it just starts all over again. Well, when I went into Strider the second time, the can't remember if it was a physician's assistant or a doctor, but she poked her head down the hall because she could hear that, that breathing. And she's like, oh my God. So she runs down the hall and she grabs the wheelchair and she pushes me into this room that's got a bed in it and is clean. (laughs) And they get me up on the bed. Well, now I'm like in full-blown anaphylaxis. We have no IV access. I've already had two shots of epi. You don't want to, you know, explode the person's heart because it's basically just adrenaline. And um, they're trying to get an IV in and the, the doctor says, we need to move her across to trauma. And I'm like, oh, crap, this is going to go really bad. And so they're like hustling. People are throwing stuff. We get across to, to trauma. Um, I've got people on either side of me both trying to get IVs, and they get this very tenuous IV. And I'm like, there's no way that's going to hold up to steroids and Benadryl. Benadryl really hard on your veins. And so they start like injecting me in the hips with Benadryl. I think I had had like 400 milligrams of Benadryl by the time we got off the life flight. In comparison, what is a normal amount of that? Like a normal dose would be 50 milligrams. Oh, Christ. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm there in the ER. My Don gets there. He's not my husband at the time, but he gets there and he takes one look at me and he looks at the doctor and he's like, you need to intubate her. She's going to stop breathing. And he says, no, no, we, we've got plenty of time for that. And it wasn't five minutes. And I just, that was it. I just quit breathing and fell backwards. And the next thing I knew... I was out of my body looking down and wondering who the girl in the bed was because she looked pretty sick. And, and I could see all the people kind of rushing in. I heard the code call. I could see the people rushing in and kind of pushing Don out as they were coming in. And so I was thinking, oh, I know that respiratory therapist and because you know, I knew these people. And so I heard they had turned around. Somebody had turned around to the crash cart. And I heard this noise and I knew it was the tongue blade snapping open. So they put this tongue blade in and it holds your tongue down so they can advance the ET tube over it. And then that was it. I was out. I didn't see that part. So meantime, they put me on a life flight and it's the worst electrical storm in Kentucky history, basically. And they're like, we got to, you know, she has to have life support so she can't go in an ambulance. And so um, on the life flight, they... And I, it's so funny, in all my years as a nurse, I'd never seen this, and I'd worked critical care, so it's funny that I hadn't seen it. But if they can't get an IV in you, they can drill one into your shin bone. Ooh. I don't recommend it. No. And the guy who invented it practiced on himself. He practiced <laughs> on himself? For you. It's like a Saw movie. That's right. I'm like, it's like a Dremel, and it's just got a needle that goes into it. It's got a, um, like a, a flat needle that doesn't have a super pointy end. And they just drill it into your shin bone and then they put the IV in your shin. Oh. And I remember waking up and that was my big complaint was that my shin hurt. <laughs> but anyway, so they did that. They put me on the life flight, fly me to Lexington, get to the big hospital there. And I'm in a coma at this point and, you know, they induce it. And so when I kind of resurface as far as in my own mind, I'm in my sister's car. And so she lives in Wisconsin and it's dark and it's raining and she's driving. And I'm like, what the heck? Why... And I knew something was wrong with me. I didn't feel as dense as normal. This I couldn't feel the seat against me. So I didn't say anything to her because I'm like, something really weird is going on with me and I don't want to freak her out while she's driving. And so I'm just in the back seat and I'm thinking, where is she going? The weather's terrible. You know, it's dark. Has something happened to one of the kids or Patrick? And um, she pulls over to this gas station and she pulls up under the canopy, right? So she goes to, she pulls her phone out of her purse and I lean forward and I see what she's wearing and she's all wrinkled. And I'm like, did you get dressed in the dark? What are you wearing? You're all wrinkled. You know, this must be an emergency. And she types in, um, hang on kiddo, I'm coming. And that was actually on her Facebook page. We were able to verify that. And that was it. And then I was out again. And so when I resurface again, I'm in the void. I'm just in this dark, dark black place. I always have to say this ahead of time or I get a bunch of flack. So a near-death experience, in my opinion, is not the same thing as a death experience. I think that's probably different. In a near-death experience, God knows you're going back. And being the kind of, you know, God that he is, I think he wants to give you something to either improve your own life or to help other people, both generally. So yes, I believed in God before I went. I, I wasn't sure. Like, I'm like, yeah, I believe in God. 
I hope it's true. Because <laughs> I don't want to just lay, because I'm super claustrophobic too. So I'm like, oh man, I can't lay in a casket. And the idea of being burned is like super creepy too. And and I'm like, so I used to tell Don, I'm like, okay, here's the deal. <laughs> I'm going to be like um, Snow White. You're going to make a bed of glass and you're going to encase me in it. And that way, if you ever have sex with another woman, it'll be over my dead body. <laughs> and this was our running joke, right? <laughs> How I was going to handle the glass coffin, I have no idea, <laughs> but that was the plan. And just that was just always our running joke. And so, so I always tell people that to say, you know, yes, I was a believer, but still the experience was what it was. And apparently whatever you're doing here spiritually, you're kind of building up your place in heaven. And I was just completely isolating. Um, you know, I had gotten divorced when the kids were little. David was five, I think. So I've got three kids. David's my oldest, then I've got Laura and then Jake. And and when their dad just, you know, went off the rails and left, I always say it just pulled the world out from under me because I was like, all I wanted to ever be was a mom and a wife. And, and I loved it. And, you know, and then I find out he's messing around and then he leaves the kids and, and me and doesn't, you know, doesn't make any attempt to have a relationship with them. And I always said it. And I don't mean this in a mean way, but it, it would have been easier if he had died because I could have told the kids what a wonderful father he was and they would have had this, you know, this image in their own minds rather than this guy that's supposed to be our dad just left us and had nothing to do with us. That's really hard to take. And it's really hard for kids not to think it you know, has something to do with them. And it didn't, of course. He just was who he was. But anyway, when that happened, I just was so devastated. And I'm, I'm the kind of person, I'm a stayer, you know, like even when I found out that he was cheating, I said, look, tell me everything and we'll go to counseling and we'll work on it. And this doesn't have to destroy our marriage. We have a family, you know, our obligations go beyond ourselves. We, we have to put the kids first and we need to work on this. And, and he just didn't want to do it. And um, it just, it just was such a heartbreak for me. And so I always kind of tell people, I just kind of taken these bricks and just stacked them up, you know, every time somebody hurt me or said something that was not affirming or, you know, just critical or whatever, for no reason, just to be critical. And I'd stack up those bricks and pretty soon I had built this wall and that's where I was. I was behind it. You know, I was my own prisoner, but I didn't know it. But I was safe. And so I'd go to work every day and nobody would have known I had social anxiety. To this day, people are like, no, you don't. And I'm like, I, I really do. It's like an internal struggle. I just was a very different person. So I would go to work and I was a good team member and I really liked, you know, if I could get my st stuff done, figuring out who was behind and going and helping them and, you know, just ways to kind of make, I, I love that team effort. It just, I just think it's so satisfying to be able to kind of get that going and, and bring people together to work together who might not normally otherwise. And it just, it just is such a nice work environment to have. And it's just one of, one of my gifts. And so I could do all of that with horrible social anxiety and with being completely walled off. And, but then I didn't have any friendships outside of work. We, I didn't get together with anybody. I would get anxious just about answering the telephone. So I, you know, have this whole situation happen. I'm in the void and it's, I remember waking up and thinking that I didn't know where I was, that it was super dark and it was so dark. I couldn't determine the size of the space. And I'm like, it could have been Walmart. It could have been a closet. I don't know. But when it's dark and you can't fathom the space, it just seems big, you know, because because it's overwhelming. And so I knew I wasn't standing or sitting or lying. I was just kind of suspended. And that was creepy because that's not normal. <laughs> and I was having to work to breathe. And it, it was like terrible work and painful. Like every time my, I would take a deep breath and my ribs would move, there, it was just this excruciating pain in the middle of my chest. And I don't know if I was feeling that from my body on the other side or what. But I couldn't move. And of course, that freaks me out, right? And I start to panic. And every time I would start to panic, I would just go back to sleep. I would be back in this deep sleep. And then I would wake up and be in the same place. And this just went on and on. And I started wondering, you know, after a while, you start wondering if you really lived that life at all. And I remember thinking, well, maybe I made that life up so I'd have something to think about here because there's not much to do. And the idea that this is just where I've always existed is horrible. So maybe I never lived that life or maybe maybe I lived it and I did something terrible and and I disappeared and no one's looking for me or or no one cares where I am because I did something so terrible and I, I just couldn't figure it out and so I went back and forth and then at one point I wake up 
and something tells me to lean forward. And so when I leaned forward, it wasn't like you lean forward at the waist, like my whole body tipped. And when I tipped, I started moving that direction. And I'm like, oh, holy cow, I can move. This is amazing. So I'm thinking, okay, left seems good. And I always tell people, I'm like, if you've ever, like, like I'm scared of skiing and things like that, because it seems very counterintuitive to me to be standing on something slippery going 80 miles an hour, like that, Mm -hmm. that doesn't seem safe. But now I'm flying in this space and I'm, it's like the further forward I lean, the faster it is. I can't see. I could hit a tree at any moment because I have no idea where I am. But there was some light ahead and I thought, okay, that's the spot. There's no light anywhere else. And so I go to this light and when I get there, there's, you're too young to remember this, but they used to make um, these glass blocks and they would put them up in hotel showers and stuff. And so they distort that you can tell there's somebody on the other side, but it's super distorted. Well, that's what it was like looking through. So I, I put my face up to the glass and put my hands on it. And as I peered through, things on the other side became clearer. And there I was in the hospital laying in the bed. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm alive. I'm just really sick or something, which is great news because I could get well. And my daughter is standing back into my right in front of the ventilator. And I remember she had this red plaid shirt on and I somehow remembered that it was summer. And I'm thinking, what? Why is she wearing that long sleeve um, flannel shirt in the summer? And I could see the fibers so clearly that I knew what they felt like. I had this super acute vision. And I could see that I was restrained to the bed, which of course makes me nervous. And, and so then I start going through everything that's in the room. I'm looking at the IV pumps and what's going. And I'm like, okay, propofol. So I'm sedated. I looked at my vital signs and they all looked, you know, relatively good. Um, looked at the settings on the ventilator, and I couldn't figure out what had happened, but, you know, I was critical but stable. And so I'm like, okay, all right, this, maybe I had an accident, I don't know. And I could, I looked at my daughter, and I could feel her emotions. And I always tell people, my daughter's a Scorpio, nobody knows what's going on in that kid, (laughs) her entire life. I've had no clue what's going on. But in that moment, I 100% knew her. And it was such an experience, because the boys were like open books. But she's just always been very private and she's not super emotional and you just don't know what's going on in her head until she like spouts out with something hysterical. And and so I saw her and I I could feel that she was scared and I had never seen her scared before really. And so I put my arms out to grab her to pull her to me and my hands hit the wall and I just lost it. I was so mad. And I'm like, what kind of, try not to use bad words, what kind of messed up business is this? You know, you let me see my kid, you let me see me, and now I can't, I can't get through? Like, what, this is just, that's just mean. There's, there's no good reason for that. And so I'm kind of losing it on the other side of the wall, and I get sucked back into the void. So it's like the next day, I guess, I don't know. Time is just super different there. Like, everything is happening at once, but there's no chaos. And it still seems kind of chronological. It's really weird. And time here, like when I got back, seems super messed up, because there you can, like, thought create. And so there's no delay. Like if I thought ball, there would be a ball in my hand. And here, like if I think ball, I'm like, oh crap, where did I put that ball? And I got to go and look and, you know. So when you were explaining how you were in the car, then you were in the void, then you were at the hospital, then you got sucked back. Is that like, it's kind of like the transportation kind of cut off? You just arrive at places? Is that why you mean it kind of feel distorted? Yeah, I just kind of arrived. It's like this weird, I don't know, cosmic pinball nonsense. I don't know what it was. Yeah, it makes sense. And it doesn't so make I, any sense, but it makes sense the way you're describing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just, it's it's really, st- I remember for months, I couldn't even write about it because I, I, I'm like, I, there aren't words here to describe. So anyway, I, I get sucked back and I'm back in the place where I was, but I know how to move now. And so I wake back up, I move, I go back to the wall. And this time it's like a bubble and I can see that, Um, it's moving like breathing. And I look through it and I see me again and I'm like, okay, I must have to like get over there. And then maybe once I get over there, I get across this bubble thing, then I'll just get sucked back into me and then I'll wake up and be be okay. And they'll take me off the ventilator and I'll live because nobody gives you instructions, you know, for what happens when you get there. So I put my hand through the wall through the bubble thing and it went through. And so part of me was on one side. And I remember that being like, super awesome. I was like, oh, wow, look at that. It went right through. Like I'm over there and I'm here. And and I'm kind of that person that I can find the awe in just about anything. But that was really cool. 
And so then I put my other hand through. And as I put my other hand through, all of me went through. So now I'm like above me, kind of like in the emergency room looking down. And I'm like, okay, well, I didn't get sucked back in. Like, do I need to like hover closer and kind of like lay over the top of her? And then will I get sucked in like a sponge or... I knew that that wasn't going to work. And so I noticed the wrist restraints again. And I was in, we put everybody in soft restraints so they don't pull their tubes out. And I didn't like that. And so I thought, okay, I just, apparently I need to wake me up. And so I'm looking at the me in the bed and I'm like, come on now, wake up, wake up. You can do it. Just open your eyes. And this futile thing goes on until I get pissed. And, and I'm like, son of a gun, what the heck? Like, what is this? entertaining? Like what? I don't understand the purpose of this. This just seems mean. And so I thought, okay, calm down. You're going to get sucked back out if you get all mad. And I thought, I'm starting too big. Let's see if I can get her to move her finger. And so I'm looking at my finger like, how am I going to somehow will this to happen, right? But I'm, I'm convinced that's it. And so I'm trying to get me to move my finger and I'm like, damn it, you know, she just won't cooperate. So I get sucked back, but just to the other side of the wall. And I'm just beside myself. I'm like, I just, I don't understand. Like, why can't I get back? What is it? Is there something I'm supposed to learn? You know, am I in this place to be punished? And then it just occurred to me that I had made it, that this place was of my own design. And it was like that light bulb epiphany moment. And I looked around and I, and I could almost see in my mind's eye, me stacking those bricks up all those years. And I'd never seen it before that moment. Like I can explain it really well now, but then it was just kind of all coming together as an idea. And so I could see me stacking up all those bricks and just isolating myself off and becoming my own prisoner. And while I was safe behind the wall, that's all I was. And not even that really, you know, I mean, I was still getting hurt and stuff, but I just, I wasn't living. So there was no, it was just all bad. And as soon as I realized I had made that place spiritually, it started to crack. And so I always tell people, I grew up in Michigan and and Michigan, Lake Erie freezes really, really solid. At least it did when I was a kid. And in the spring, dad would take us down to the beach and you could hear the ice starting to thaw. And it would make these little cracks. And then it would, it would, the crack would travel out down a seam kind of. And it's just this weird haunting noise if you've never heard it. And it kind of, it's, it's like a low thunder. And I remember thinking that was the coolest thing as a kid. Well, I heard that noise and I thought the ice, you know, but the darkness started to split like I was in an egg or something. And I could see it at the top crack and light just starts pouring in. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like, it's like finding out you won the lottery, I think. I mean, I've never won the lottery, but I imagine it would be a lot like that. Like you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. I actually won, you know, and you keep looking at the ticket and comparing the numbers. <laughs> I, was, I was just like, there's an out, there's a way to get out. And it's apparently not through that hospital room, which was weird because that's how I assumed it was going to go. And and so the, the thing just keeps cracking and I can actually see the cracks and the light filling in the cracks and then it just starts kind of falling apart. Well, then this bright spirit comes and she's huge, like grand huge. And she comes and she gets closer and closer to me and I knew I knew her, but I didn't know who she was. I, I knew it would become evident. And she just had this incredible energy. And so she puts her arms out like this and I'm just immediately drawn into them like I didn't have to move or anything and so she's got me against her chest and I'm at this point just I've fallen apart I'm like oh my gosh there's another person here and I'm crying like ugly crying you know <laughs> she's like <laughs> she's like it's okay you know calm yourself dear one and as she said it it was like morphine man I just was like <laughs> immediately calm and I'm like whoa that's a trick and it was I noticed that we weren't talking, that she would have a thought and I would know it and I would think a question and before I could even get it out, she was answering it. And I'm like, wow, that's super efficient. And so she's got me against her chest and she's holding me and all those shards of the darkness are flying around and they're trying to get in toward me. And so she would just put her fist out and she'd hit that shard and it would just be cast away and it, it was gone. And so she's casting all these shards away and I'm crying like a fool and I'm trying to figure out who she is. And so I look up and she's got these like emerald green eyes and I'm thinking, man, I know her from somewhere. Who is this? And I look up and on her head, she's got this orange red hair that looks like it's on fire. It's dancing on her head. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's, it's my grandma. And so it's my mom's mom who was Levita Florence Petrius. 
And she was a force. And I always say, you know, I am, I am Levita's kid, if anybody's, because people either loved her or they hated her. She was very polarizing. So people who were like lazy or corrupt did not like her because she had this, Don says, overdeveloped sense of justice. And she really did. Like she couldn't let it go. And I'm so much the same way. And when we were kids, she lived in the apartment over our house. And she would go to work at the steel stamping plant. I can't remember exactly where it was in Michigan. And she'd come home and she'd be just soaked with sweat. They didn't have any air conditioning in there. It was over 100 degrees every day. I mean, you just imagine that kind of work. And this plant was primarily women. And my grandmother had a friend who got her arm caught in the steel stamping machine and it tore her arm off. And they just fired her. There was like no work comp or anything. And, you know, now she can't work. She can't get a job because she's got no functional arm. And and it just went all over my grandmother. And she's like, no, I'm going to start a union. And my dad's like, Levita, you don't want to do that. You know, there's going to be all kinds of trouble if you do that. And the plants that where most of the men worked were unionized, much to the dislike of the people who owned the business, of course. And so she just kept pushing it and pushing it. And she was going to do it. And she was getting a lot of flack. And the women were scared to go, you know, to come on board with her. But she's, she's a force, you know. And so one day, I, I'm probably four maybe, and I'm sitting out on the front porch, and she's not come home yet. And so I kept asking my mom, I'm like, where is she? She's, she's here by now. You know, where's, where is grandma? She's late. And she said, it's fine. You know, she'll be home. Don't worry. You know, go outside and play. And so she kept sending me out. And then it started getting dark. And then she got worried. And so she's standing outside. And I'm like, where is she? She's like, I'm sure it's fine. But she doesn't look like she's sure it's fine. And my dad's home now. And he's worried. And so finally, this black car, this big, long black car, not like a limousine, I don't know what it was, rolls up and the back door opens and my grandmother's like rolls out onto the pavement and they take off. And so she's all shook up, you know, and she comes in and she said they took her to the Detroit River and they told her if she didn't quit, that's where she was going to end up. Wow. So she continues. <laughs> because she's that's, my yeah, grandmother. That's pretty, uh, pretty mafioso there. Right, right. And there's a lot of that in Michigan. People don't realize And so she goes, she starts the union, and then she died when I was nine or 10. And um, she just was this force. So anyway, so that's who greets me. And I was so excited to see her. And I'm like, you're not dead. She said, of course, I'm not dead. You know, she said, there's no death. You're either alive on physical body or you're super alive here. That's, you know, there's no death. And she said, except for that your body can become useless and be cast away. And I'm like, oh, that seems really smart. You know, why didn't I know that? Wait, now you guys are speaking or is this a knowingness? What what is no, what is this communication? Just telepathic. Telepathic. Yeah, just telepathically. Wild. Okay. And she says to me, she, she says, You know this, you learned this. And I'm like, No, I I didn't know that. And she's like, I thought there would be some dead time, you know, where you'd be, you know, like in a box or I mean I don't know I yeah. just this is the things <laughs> I mean, you just kind knows? of assume now, right now you do right right I grew up Catholic I was sure that God was gonna you know punch me in the face as soon as he saw me anyway so it wasn't well, God <laughs> so is one of your patients people. apparently because right. <laughs> the, the Catholic God in my experience this isn't all Catholics but in my experience you were always in trouble you know you you better you better be constantly praying for forgiveness because God forbid you don't and then you die and then you're screwed pretty much yeah a lot of repentance so anyway, my grandmother said, you know, you know this, you learned this in school, um, you know, about death. And, and I'm like, no, I don't think I did. And she's like, yes, you did. Energy isn't created or destroyed. It just changes form. That's God's rule borrowed by man. And I, it just, like, if you can get your brain around that, this idea, you are energy. I mean, you are electrical impulses. I thought, She's right. You know, there's all this electricity, all the electrolytes in your body are electrolytes. They're, they're charged. Sodium's charged, potassium's charged. So you are energy. There's heat energy that comes off you. And I always tell people that don't believe that there's anything outside this. I said, have you ever been like in your car or at a party or something and you feel somebody staring at you? And everybody, of course, says yes. And I'm like, how often do you look at the wrong person first? Never. You know exactly where it's coming from. How is that possible? How is it that you are in tune enough, even in a crowded environment where you'd be distracted or driving? I don't ever look left if I, I always know it's, you know, where it is. And I look and that's the person who's looking at me. And I'm like, so we are attached. There is this energy. And so when she said that, I'm like, that's like the 
best argument for this, you know, of all the arguments I've had to try to convince people that there is a God, that one actually makes sense. So anyway, I I just thought that was amazing. And she was more her. And it's so funny, people will say, well, when you see somebody who's, you know, died, are they always younger? And and I always assumed that. I always thought that's what I was seeing. But I'm like, no, it's it's not that. It's that when you get on the other side, all of the things that are BS that you thought about yourself and that other people put on you and thought about you, those all fall away. And because all of those wrong thoughts and wrong ideas and wrong perceptions fall away, you look vibrant. And it's not so much that you look younger, but that all the lies have fallen off of you, even the ones you believe about yourself. And I'm like, that's beautiful. That's amazing. And you're saying those are the thoughts and the lies from other people or not your own opinion of yourself? Both. And this is all happening in the, in the, are you still calling it the void at this point that you're in front of your grandmother? Well, I'm in the light now. And, and there's like other people there that I don't know. And I remember thinking they, they were strange because like one guy's wearing, I don't know what that's called, like the little cloth that covers your man bits. And that's all he's got on. <laughs> right? And I'm like, wow, I need, where do you get those? You know, these days, I don't <laughs> think... Only the these... void, two ninety nine. I know, right? <laughs> I'm super pragmatic all the time. And then there was this guy wearing a robe, and then there was this woman just wearing regular clothes. And I remember thinking, like, what's what's with the wardrobe, you know? And, and my grandma's like, oh, people, they wear what they thought they would wear when they got here. And I'm like, interesting. That almost goes back to your... Uh, I mean, sorry if you're, I'm jumping the gun and you're going to get there, but no, go uh, you kind of created where you were and is that is that what you're yeah. saying as to what what happens after or during that moment is people are just like heaven is what you think it is I think not so much that I think heaven is the spiritual things that you're building up so like you know everybody's like oh there's streets of gold and I don't know that I ever even got into heaven I think I was in this kind of before space so maybe there are streets of gold I, I don't know where I was, there weren't, but I was not under the misimpression that I was in heaven because there were very few people there. But when we do things here, there is a spiritual manifestation of them. So like you contacted me and I think it was like forever before I saw it or something, but I, I messaged you back. And so after we talked, I, I always do this. So I, I close out that conversation and I just kind of focused on you. And I was like, okay, you know, I open up who he is to me, you know, kind of in a prayer sort of thing. He has energy. I have energy. There's, it's not coincidence that he saw my story. It's not coincidence that, that we're going to be talking. And so I always ask God, like for each, my talks are always different. And it's so funny because people, well, I try to answer all the comments, but like one video has over a million and you just can't do that. But I try you know, especially if anybody's got like a mean, snarky comment, I always try to answer them. Oh, you do give that attention? So I, I can kind of weigh it. I'm pretty good at judging it. So I can look at it and see if the person is just lashing out because they're hurt. Because most people won't sit through a long video just to throw shade. You know, they there's something that's triggering them to make that comment. Because I'm like, well, if you think it's all BS, why would you waste 20 minutes of your day watching this video? Like, move on. Yeah. What, why are you looking for these at all? Like, did it just scroll through or what? But I always feel like that comes from hurt and that it's probably some Christian's fault. Yeah. <laughs> like, I need to at least weigh in and apologize. Oh, that's nice of you. You know, because I'm like, it's, they're angry and, and they think that they are unloved by God for whatever they're doing because that's what somebody told them. And I'm like, okay, well, first of all, I'm sorry somebody told you that. And second of all, it's not true. And that's not the nature of God at all. That's the nature of man. And we kind of try to fit God in that box because that feels safe because we understand that. But God's huge. Like, you know, people say, well, is, you know, are these people going to be in heaven? And I'm like, I would not even try to venture a guess. <laughs> um, so I'm there with my grandmother. I try not to get too far off track. Oh, what I was going to tell you is all these talks are different. And so, and I don't watch other people's near-death experiences because you become so intuitive after a near-death experience. It's really easy to pick up elements of other people's story and you'll wonder, okay, that seems really familiar. Did that happen to me? Or, and I never wanted to like, because I've seen it happen. I've seen writers that have had near-death experience incorporate the experience of others thinking it was theirs. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. I want my story to be pure because like I can talk to you, right? You and I, if you and I were having a personal conversation and I'll get these senses about things about you 
And when I go away from it later, I'm like, okay, did he say something that led me to that? Or was that just a sense I had about him? Well, it's kind of the same way if you start watching, if you've had a near-death experience or any kind of experience, and you start watching all kinds of videos that other people do about that, pretty soon that kind of gets melded together. And you're left like, oh, wait, no, 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 that, that happened to that person. Like when my, when my son was little, my oldest son, because I was a single mom, I was poor and we never went to Disneyland or Disney World, right? Well, when he was really little, Disney World sent us a promotional video and David watched it so many times. So one day we're at my sister's house. He's like 11 years old and he's telling her about the time we went to Disney World. (laughs) And I'm listening to him tell the story and it's this video. And so I don't say anything because I can't afford to take him and he thinks he's already been. So check, right? So (laughs) I tell my sister, I'm like, we never went. She's like, why does he think he went? I'm like, he watched that video like a hundred times when he was two years old. He actually thinks he's been there. You know, of course, I eventually told him because it felt wrong. But I mean, (laughs) I rode that train for as long as I could because there was no Disney Wait, so then are you saying, at first I understood it as, and correct me please, as I thought perhaps, this is my own interpretation, but maybe you're kind of like leveling up to a new level of consciousness, meaning like a new level of awareness. So is that tying it all together? Or are you just saying it's from the repetition of, listening to other people? I think just the repetition of listening to other people can lead you to accidentally incorporate your story. And I've seen it. Neil Donald Walsh, who wrote Conversations with God, used to tell this story about going to a play that his son was in. And then the kids somehow got something mixed up and they were supposed to all hold up this little sign. And together it would spell, I don't, I can't remember what it was supposed to spell. Well, this woman who this actually happened to, contacts him and is like, hey, that's my story. I have that written and published from 19 whatever. He had read that so many times that somehow he thought it had happened. So he comes out like he doesn't, tr- he doesn't try to hide it or anything. He comes out and he's like, I guess I read that so many times. It just got stored in my brain as something that had happened to me. And so, you know, of course he apologized and, you know, for plagiarizing her story and he got a lot of grief for it. And I'm like, before I thought, oh, that's BS, you know, he, he stole her story. He just didn't think she'd ever say anything, which may be true. But I've seen that happen. I've seen people hear a story enough that they think that, that it's one way and then they get with their family and they're like, no, that's not what happened at all. And so I now understood that, that we are energy and that we don't cease to exist. We just change forms. And that was really good to know because it kind of gave me this assurance that what I was experiencing was real. I had to be somewhere and this is where I was. And so my grandmother just leaves and I didn't realize she had left and I'm still kind of suspended and I'm just light, like my body's light. I didn't have clothes or anything like that that I recall. And, and so I'm just kind of floating in this space, just absorbing everything that I've you know, that's gone on. And, and all of a sudden I hear this like shaking, like if you're at a concert and they turn the bass up really high, you know how you can feel it in your bones? Mm -hmm. That's what it was like. And I could feel this vibration in, in like all the way to my middle and everything that had ever existed and everything that didn't exist yet, but would exist all shook. And I immediately knew it was God. And I'm like, oh crap. (laughs) That was my immediate reaction. And so I'm trying to, because now I know that my grandmother could read my thoughts. And I'm pretty sure if she could do it, God can. (laughs) And so now I'm like, okay, think of a good memory. Think of something right you've done in your life. Because, you know, I don't want him just randomly picking through my brains. I want something easy that, you know, (laughs) it's so stupid. (laughs) I kind of get what you're saying. That's the first thought. If you know someone can read your mind, you don't want to be thinking about weird shit. Yeah, it's like your mom walking on in, in on you while you're taking a shower or something. You're like, oh, crap. No, no let's no, like make it stop. And so I know he's going to come and he's going to be able to read my mind. And, and, and I cannot conjure one good thing that I've done. And I've, I've been a pretty decent human. And, and I'm, I can think of nothing. I'm like, oh, come on. There's got to be. No, no. I used the F word several times when I was in labor with David. Can't use that one. You know, and I'm tr- I just can't think of anything. And so he's suddenly there. And it's not. And I say he, but I did not see any sort of human form that would validate that. It just felt like a very masculine energy to me. And he, and he was just light and like, light like looking at the sun without it hurting your eyes or leaving spots when you look away and, and light. And it, there wasn't a heat to it that was painful or anything, but there he is, right? And I'm still <laughs> trying to think of something. And um, he says, I am. 
And I had heard that a million times. I had read it in the Bible. You know, I am that I am. And I'm like, what is, do you see Popeye? What is that? That's like the (laughs) weirdest thing to say. It's not like his title. It's, I don't know. I've yet to be able to find words to explain what that meant to me. But it was pretty much that this was, you know, the creator of the universe. If, you know, we all say that, but to actually realize it and be in the presence of it is, is something completely different. Because I can say it and I can believe it, but actually seeing it and being there adds this whole dimension to it that I can't quite capture with the language that we have. And I've been working on it for years. Thank you for listening to part one of this episode series with Penny to listen to the rest of her amazing story into more detail and how this all pans out. Please tune in to part two that I will be dropping next week. Thank you. Thank you.